Okay, welcome to the hottest seminar. Uh, this week's speaker is John Sterling from Carnegie Mellon University. And the title of this talk is Objective Meta Theory of Dependent Type Theories. Go ahead, John. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, I want to thank the organizers of the hottest seminar for uh, giving me the opportunity to speak to you all here. Um, I want to warn you that uh, the slides I'm going to be showing a little light on references. I realized that uh, I could either do kind of a halfway job in the slides or a full job in the paper. So please just see uh, a draft of myself and Carlo and Julie that you can find on my website for more thorough references. And I'll try to give call outs to um, the source of various ideas uh, verbally during the talk. Um, let's see, so I will be describing uh, mostly joint work with Carlo and Julie and, uh, and also uh, Daniel Gretzer. So I always like to begin by uh, executing a bit of a diatribe on uh, what I think the meaning of, of type theory is. Um, type theory means many things to many people. And I think that uh, while many of those considerations are contradictory with each other, there are a couple things that really make type theory type theory for everyone. Um, so first of all, in type theory, uh, so a typical situation you have is that you have your uh, actual type theory stuff is happening in some kind of an upstairs land. And then this is all happening relative to uh, an arbitrary base, which type theorists call a context. Um, and the idea is that type theory kind of builds into itself from the very beginning, the relative point of view that was uh, um, put forward so forcefully by, uh, by Grothendieck. Um, the idea being that you can do a change of base along a morphism downstairs and, uh, and, and get a corresponding uh, um, lift upstairs. Um, in type theory, this is called a substitution. Um, so type theory is sort of a, a language or a discipline that makes this operation primitive and is optimized for doing it all the time. Um, now, Another aspect of type theory that's very important is um, it's the fact that uh, if, well, so we have to understand what this A thing is. Uh, so in, so a type in type theory is a family. It's a family that's indexed in the base, in this case, gamma. But what makes type theory a little bit different from uh, other kinds of ways of thinking about families is that in type theory, well, if we try to understand what that thing is, we look real close, we can see that it's really not a map into gamma, but we actually think of it from the perspective of a characteristic map from the base gamma into some kind of a weakly classifying object of types or something like this. And usually this collection of types is like, it has a, its chi is too high to fit in the same category as gamma. Uh, so usually we will have it live somewhere else, maybe uh, linked by a Yoneda embedding. Um, and then the actual collection of elements of such a family is gotten by uh, pulling back this uh, sort of generic family of terms indexed in types um, along the characteristic map. And uh, so in summary, uh, this perspective, the perspective of types as maps into a, some kind of a weakly classifying object allows the pullback or the change of base to be implemented by uh, precomposition. The use of precomposition here is very good because in type theory, this enables a coherent uh, choice of pullbacks. Finding uh, a systematic way to make sure that you use precomposition everywhere is called a coherence theorem. And so this is to me, these two aspects, relative point of view and thinking about families from the perspective of the classifying maps. Uh, this is to me what type theory is all about. Uh, maybe a more controversial question to ask is who is a type theorist? I think all of us in this room are maybe type theorists in some sense that we use type theory to, uh, to study what we are interested in. Um, and probably everyone is in some sense studying the initial model of type theory because we're interested in the things that we can actually prove. Like if you formalize things in a proof assistant, you want to actually type things in and check it, uh, see that it is correct. And, just using the initial model or the syntax of a theory. Um, but what type theorists in particular, or people that I would maybe would identify themselves as type theorists, have uh, um, 
slightly differently from this is that we like to study the aspects of the initial model that are so non-type theoretic that they don't have to be preserved along homomorphisms of models. Um, any property of the initial model that is type theoretic is automatically inherited by all the models. Uh, so we want to study these sort of emergent properties, these sort of bizarre things that happen especially or only in the initial model. Uh, so in uh, historically type theorists and structural proof theorists have referred to these kind of emergent properties as, as admissibilities. I don't like to use that word because admissibility also means some kind of uh, a lot of very irrational stuff that uh, it's not that important. Um, but maybe this is a fine word for, for what I'm talking about. And when, a, when one of these admissibilities or emergent structures is important enough, we call it a meta theorem. Uh, so the basic picture here is that you have some kind of an initial model, which is given by syntax of type theory, and any other model is linked by a universal map from the initial model. And that map preserves all of the type theoretic structures and statements. And type theoretic structures and statements, these are judgments of type theory, like A is a type or M is an element of A. And of course, the specific judgments of the type theory are kind of fungible, but usually they have this, uh, this character. And um, uh, so what is preserved by these homomorphisms is a single judgment, not an entailment of judgments. Um, on the other hand, the rules of type theory are entailments of judgments, um, and only some of these get preserved. Um, an example of an entailment of judgments that uh, actually holds bizarrely in the initial model of type theory, but not in almost any other model, except for some very perverse models, which some of you might be able to take a guess at, is um, the fact that, uh, well, it's called the injectivity of type constructors. For instance, if A arrow B and A prime arrow B prime are uh, equal as types, then A and A prime are equal as types. Now, if you think about what this would mean in a semantic model, it's clearly nonsense because you could find more ways for those two things to be equal than that the components should be equal. But this is actually unbelievably important from the perspective of the syntax of type theory. It's actually, this is the linchpin of almost all implementations of type theory. So this is the kind of theorem that we want to prove uh, because we want to implement type theory. We want to be able to use it um, in a computer. So, um, one of, uh, so injectivity of type constructors is an important uh, uh, fact about the initial model that doesn't hold for other models. Other important facts are things like normalization, which, is, uh, which you use to prove the injectivity of type constructors usually, and it also implies the decidability of uh, judgmental equality. And combined normalization and injectivity, um, they allow you to uh, show that the, the type checking problem is decidable. This, this is how we implement proof assistance, or at least we try to make type theories that satisfy these properties because then in that case, we have a really good way to implement a proof assistant. And if these things fail, we have only kind of bad ways to implement proof assistants that don't work so well in practice. Um, hey John, can I just clarify sure. that injectivity statement? What kind of equality were you ah, using? That's there? a very good question. Um, so the injectivity is up to the, uh, the exact or judgmental equality. Um, so it's the equality judgment, not uh, paths or internal equality. Um, so the reason that it's possible for this to be true in the syntax is that you, um, you do not have the ability to hypothesize a, um, a judgmental equality. Whereas uh, path equality, you can always put one of those in the context, which you can use to refute the statement. So all of these uh, structures on type theory, they're kind of proved in the same way. And so for many years, type theorists, we've used a method um, that we call Tate's method, or the method of computability that was um, invented by Tate in, I think, 19, 1967. Um, the basic idea is that you attach to every aspect of the syntax of type theory some kind of data or property. Um, uh, usually this is called uh, a computability property. Um, you construct an interpretation of the syntax of type theory in which a type is turned into some kind of a family, maybe a family of sets or something like that, that's indexed in the elements, the syntactic elements of that type. And this object is called a computability family. 
Now, in the 1970s, um, for completely different reasons, uh, the Grothendieck School of um, uh, Algebraic Geometry invented uh, something called gluing, which from the perspective of geometry is kind of a way to like fracture a space along like a, like a subterminal. Um, and uh, this, um, this was observed by Peter Fried to have a connection to logic. Um, so Peter Fried in 1978 uh, used uh, Artin gluing uh, together with the three topos with respect to logical functors uh, to prove essentially the existence and disjunction properties of intuitionistic higher order logic. Um, and since then, uh, there's been a lot of interest in gluing as a way to rationalize uh, Tate's method in a mathematical way. Um, so the basic picture that I would like to portray here is that you have one of these meta theorems uh, like canonicity, which is the statement that every, um, say, every closed element of a, say, the type of natural numbers or something like that is equal to a numeral or a constant. Um, normalization, which is a stronger meta theorem that uh, characterizes the judgmental equivalence classes of open terms, it's terms that have free variables in them, or decidability of judgmental equality, and so on and so forth. And you want to construe this meta theorem as itself a model of the type theory that lies over the initial model of the type theory. Um, for example, if I'm trying to prove canonicity, I want to make a special model of the type theory where a type is uh, a family of sets, it's indexed in the closed terms of that type. And then I will arrange for the interpretation of the natural numbers in that model to associate a numeral. Uh, to each closed term. And then this squiggly map here uh, is simply projecting out the syntax from, uh, from that uh, model. Now, the main power move that we have available is that the syntax of type theory has a universal property. So when we want to say, in the case of proving canonicity, take a closed term of type nat um, and find out uh, what numeral it encodes, well, first we can go from the syntax into the special model uh, using the universal map of the syntax, which we get as soon as we have shown that the, this uh, object here really is a model of the type theory. And so what we get from that is we, so we put in a term of type nat, and then we get a numeral. And this numeral can be seen to correspond to the term that we put in because this diagram commutes. And this diagram necessarily commutes because of the universality of the syntax. Um, so this has to be the identity map. Now, sometimes this commutes up to a higher cell, but uh, it doesn't really matter. No matter how high dimensional this is, you can always kind of correct things until you get a strict statement about uh, the input. So in order to actually uh, make this more precise, um, uh, we have to agree momentarily on uh, what a type theory is and what a model of type theory is and so on. A lot of different possible notions. Um, my opinion is that among the good ones, you should just use whatever you feel like using. And today I'm going to use um, an approach uh, from uh, uh, Taichi Uemura. Before I uh, describe that, let me just make a few remarks. This picture here um, can be seen as a sort of objectification of Tate's uh, method of computability. What I mean by objectification, um, alluding to my title, is two things. First of all, um, it is objective in the sense that what I mean by syntax is abstract syntax. And by abstract syntax, I don't mean raw terms. I mean the category of contexts. That's what I mean by uh, abstract syntax. So I, I mean it in the sort of Leverian sense. So what we do not depend on when we use this method is any particular way to encode the syntax of type theory as trees or any particular way to arrange the rules of type theory. We do not care about whether or not uh, the elimination form for the, for the exponential is given by an application term or by something that inverts the lambda abstraction. These are things that uh, are kind of below us at this point. And the theorems that we prove will, uh, they will apply to any syntactic presentation of the type theory that can be shown to be sound and complete for the real syntax, uh, which is the initial model. Um, the other uh, sense in which um, it objectifies Tate's method is that we are no longer concerned with uh, properties of, the, of uh, terms. 
So in Tate's original method, what you do is you, you uh, have a property of raw terms that is a property of trees that says something like, this term normalizes. Like if you reduce it, it will normalize, it will terminate or something like that. And um, what we do in this context is we actually consider general structures. So maybe to make it a little bit more clear, this map here, sort of induction motive, in Tate's method, the fibers of this have to be propositions. Uh, but in this gluing method, they can be um, general things. They don't have to be propositions. Uh, this is actually really important because if you want to prove, say, normalization, uh, you cannot make sense of that as a property of abstract syntax. Normalization is only a property of raw syntax. On the other hand, you can make sense of normalization as a structure over abstract syntax. Uh, which uh, the issue being that um, abstract syntax is quotiented up to definitional equality. And so a normal form is not something that you can extract from the equivalence class a priori. So you need it to be a structure. Um, so uh, what is a type theory for me today? And it may not be this tomorrow, but uh, so what Uemura in his paper, The General Framework for the Semantics of Type Theory uh, has done is given a kind of general notion of type theory that covers many examples. So for him, a type theory is a, uh, a Lex category. It's a category with finite limits. Um, and a judgment of this type theory is a map in this category. So the simplest example would be the type judgment. This is like the judgment that says that A is a type. And this is just an object in the category, and, and the judgment is this map here uh, into the terminal object. Um, and on the other hand, you might consider a judgment of terms of a specific type. And the variation of that judgment in types, or what type theorists call the presupposition of the judgment, is, uh, is just given by considering the fibers of such a map. And in addition to having objects and maps and so on, uh, there's a, um, uh, a special distinguished class of what uh, Uemura calls representable maps. And a representable map is special in the following sense. If you consider the pullback functor, for a representable map. And to be concrete, in this case, the representable map would be the thing that projects a type from a typed term. If you consider the pullback factor, it has a right adjoint, a push forward. Um, from the perspective of type theory and logic, this implements a hypothetical judgment. Uh, it allows you to assume an element of a particular fiber of this map, in this case, an element of a type. Um, uh, so, Another way to think about this stuff is that the, uh, so one of these gadgets is called a representable map category. It's a category with a distinguished class of representable maps and you have all finite limits and representable maps are closed under pullback and uh, you have push forwards along representable maps. And the category of representable map categories has an internal language. And the internal language is some kind of an extensional type theory with only some dependent products. And this internal language of representable map categories can be seen to be a logical framework in which to specify specific type theories. Uh, so a model of a type theory in this sense is going to be just a functor from the type theory as a category into a category of presheaves. Now, this may be a little weird from the perspective of functorial semantics where we usually want to consider arbitrary categories uh, as the codomain. Uh, but the point of considering a category of presheaves is that the base category is going to be the category of contexts for the model. And then the judgments of the type theory live in its free co-completion. Um, this makes sense considering that uh, what I said at the beginning about how like um, usually the collection of types is somehow too big to make sense as a context, uh, but it does make sense as a pre-sheaf. Um, at a specific context, it is the collection of types in that context. Um, and this functor is required to preserve some stuff. So it's required to preserve representable maps and uh, to preserve push forwards along representable maps and it's required to preserve finite limits. Now, a representable map in the pre-sheaf category, this is actually given by a canonical representable map structure um, and uh, these actually uh, go back to Grothendieck. Uh, a representable map in the category of presheafs is one where if you take the fiber at a representable object, you get a representable object. 
So this is sort of always how you generalize a notion that makes sense on objects to a notion that makes sense on maps. Um, and uh, in particular, if you um, consider the type theory that has a single representable map and nothing else, then the models of this type theory are exactly Audi's natural models. Um, the, uh, um, uh, also known as categories of families, and uh, there's a lot of names for these things. Um, so if you look at this picture of what's happening in the concrete case of the representable map that co correspond to terms varying over types is that you have a context extension. Representable object is a context, and so if you take the fiber uh, at a particular context, which means giving a specific type in that context, then you get a context extension here, uh, uh, gamma dot A. And this map here is the weakening substitution or the projection. And this map here is the variable term. It's a generic element of type A in that context. Um, so what about gluing? How do we prove stuff? So forgetting about type theory for a moment, gluing theorems basically work in the following way. You have some category of interest. Um, maybe it's a model of some kind of a theory. And then you have another category which provides some kind of semantics. So C, let C for concreteness be the category of context of the model of type theory. And let E, um, let E be a growth in topos for now. Um, pretty much all of our examples will be growth in topoi. So the gluing of uh, C um, into E along a functor from C into E is uh, going to be this pullback here. So the idea is that we will have, uh, consider the case where E is set, and then the downstairs map here is the global sections functor. Then uh, over here, we have families of sets. And if we pull back along here, then we're gonna get families of sets that are indexed in the global sections of a context. So one of these families is called a computability family um, uh, in the parlance of type theorists and logicians. And so then the question that we want to ask is, well, C supports the structure of a model of type theory. What does this downstairs functor need to do, need to preserve, in order to ensure that G supports the structure of a model of type theory and that GUL, the gluing vibration here, preserves it? Uh, so what do we need? And so an Artin gluing theorem is basically for a particular kind of theory, it's a, um, a characterization of uh, um, sufficient conditions, and even better sometimes necessary and sufficient conditions on this downstairs functor uh, to get the good structures. Uh, so, um, well, let me just make a quick remark. So, um, in the context of topoi, it was uh, shown by, um, uh, in, uh, I guess, uh, SGA4, um, expose 4, section 9, uh, that um, if everything, uh, so if C is a growth unique topos and so is E, then G is a growth unique topos and GUL preserves everything in sight. If this downstairs functor is accessible and uh, preserves finite limits. Later on, it was shown that it only needs to preserve pullbacks. So that's kind of not important to me. Um, now, we would like to get a similar theorem for type theories, but the situation that we're in is roughly that C doesn't have very many finite limits. C, if you recall, only has the pullbacks that you get from doing substitutions, but you don't necessarily have other pullbacks. Um, so it may not actually be a very strong property for this functor to preserve finite limits. So maybe we need something stronger. So the theorem uh, that has been proved by uh, Carlo and Julie and myself is that flatness of F, uh, if E is a growth unique topos, flatness of F is enough um, for G to inherit the structure of a model of type theory um, and for the gluing vibration to preserve it. What I mean by inherit the structure of model of type theory is that G is the category of contexts of a model of type theory. Um, so I will uh, go into some more detail about this result and its applications. So first let's think about what flat functors do. Now there's an actual definition of flatness that you know, has some gnarly stuff about uh, like directed diagrams and stuff like that, but we don't actually need to think about that. Um, I came to this condition uh, by means of other considerations. Um, so 
suppose that um, we consider the Yoneda embedding uh, from C into pre-sheafs on C. So this is the free co-completion of uh, C. And the universal property of the free co-completion is that a uh, functor from C into uh, a co-complete category E, um, this is basically or essentially the same as a, um, a co-continuous functor from C hat into E. So universal property gives this extension, which you can actually compute with the left con extension along the Yoneda embedding. And uh, on the other hand, uh, the theorem of Diaconescu is that the category of presheafs on, uh, on C is the classifying topos for the theory of flat functors uh, out of C. So that means that a, um, a geometric morphism from a growth indeed topos E into C hat uh, corresponds to a flat functor from C into E. Now, the inverse image part of a geometric morphism is uh, called an algebraic morphism. Uh, and that is simply a co-continuous functor that is also lex. Um, what this all shakes out to is that if we start with a flat functor from C into E, uh, that's the same as having a left exact or, uh, and co-continuous uh, functor from C hat into E. Um, so uh, assuming that if C did have finite limits, if it was left exact, then um, uh, uh, this uh, this uh, extension would be left exact. Uh, but the point is that, um, how shall I put this? Um, the point is that we don't have enough finite limits here, so we actually really, 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 really need to find a strong enough property on this functor in order to make this left exact. So why is that useful? Well, what this says is that we can factor a flat functor um, uh, through the Yoneda embedding in a good way. So if we just consider the right-hand side of this picture, so what we were doing before is that we were gluing along this entire functor downstairs to get this category up here, which I'm now calling GK. But if we actually just stop in the middle and uh, glue from C hat along the algebraic morphism, uh, then we're going to get a topos. Because remember, this algebraic morphism here is, is co-continuous, so it's accessible, and it's left exact. And so according to the theorem of, uh, from SGA4, we have a, um, uh, a growth in topos up here. And this topos is actually a really, really good place to uh, work if we're trying to make a gluing model of type theory. Because everything in G, the new G here, lies over a presheaf on C, which you can think of as a semantic judgment of type theory. So for instance, the A type judgment in type theory, that's not an object of C, it's an object of C hat. And so if we want to make a glued version or a computability version of A type, then the right place to do so is not all the way over here, but rather right here. Um, so let me make a few remarks. Um, uh, let's see here. OK, so I said that. Um, so. The reason that this can actually be made to work is that, uh, so first of all, recall that the Yoneda embedding downstairs is dense. What that means is that every object of C hat, every pre-sheaf, is a certain canonical co-limit of representable objects. Basically, it's, it's um, co-limiting for like all the maps out of representable objects going into there. And we can actually see, using the stability of, uh, of co-limits under pullback, or the universality of co-limits in a topos, and uh, the uh, fact that f is co-complete, uh, excuse me, co-continuous, that this uh, upstairs morphism is also dense. Uh, so this justifies referring to these things in the top left corner as compact computability families, and the ones in the middle as general computability families. Now, because k uh, is dense, this means that we actually have a really good nerve um, uh, or a restricted Yoneda embedding. Uh, the density of K means that the corresponding functor from G into presheafs on GK is fully faithful. And in fact, we can show that it preserves representable maps. So what that means is that if we can just make a uh, representable map functor from the type theory into G, which is considerably easier than going directly into presheafs on GK, which is what we would normally need to do, then we can do the rest of the work just using this nerve. 
And uh, so our paper is uh, basically uh, describing uh, this particular technique as a, a very tractable way to do gluing models of type theory. Uh, let's see. So an application of uh, this um, uh, technique is to prove canonicity for cubical type theory. So here's the idea. Um, the notion of an interval is an algebraic notion. Um, and a, a cubical type theory, maybe one way to think about what a cubical type theory is, is one whose category of context supports, uh, has an algebra for the interval, has an interval object. And um, by uh, sort of levirology, that means that you have a finite product preserving functor from a category of cubes into the category of contexts. Now, this, uh, this functor, um, uh, of course, gives rise to a nerve that you get basically by probing each uh, context at cubes. Uh, so this, the idea of using this nerve uh, to prove uh, canonicity for cubical type theory uh, was pursued by um, and suggested by Steve Audi and Marcello Fiore. And we have recently used it to prove uh, canonicity result for cubical type theory. And the way that we actually achieve that um, is based on our other observation, we factor the nerve so maybe we didn't even need to start with the nerve, but that's how it historically happened. We first consider the Oneida embedding from C into C hat. And then the uh, algebraic morphism that corresponds to this nerve is the change of base along this uh, finite product preserving functor. What this functor does is it just takes like a, pro a product of the interval and turns it into a context in type theory. Um, and then what we do is, as I described before, we construct a uh, a functor from the type theory into G, and then we use the other nerve, the gluing nerve, the nerve of K, in order to turn that into a functor from the type theory into GK. And then this gives us a gluing model of type theory. Now the point of gluing along this so-called cubical nerve is as follows. Um, when you want to prove canonicity for ordinary type theory, you glue along the global sections functor uh, because you want to talk about terms that are absolutely closed, so global elements. And then you want to characterize the global elements of, say, the type of natural numbers. Now, in cubical type theory, um, the global elements are not so interesting. What you want to consider are the elements of a type that are varying only in the interval, but in nothing else. Those are the appropriate notion of global elements for a cubical type theory. Maybe the, another way to think about it, which I think has been pursued by uh, Thierry Cocon and Simon Huber um, and Christian Zatler, is uh, the idea of thinking of this as sort of the internal global sections functor from the perspective of cubical sets. Um, so here's basically what you do. When you want to prove a canonicity theorem, say for cubical type theory about the natural numbers, well, first of all, in the syntax of cubical type theory downstairs, letting C in this case be the category of context of the initial model of cubical type theory, uh, we can characterize the elements of the type of natural numbers by um, taking a pullback of the, um, judgment, of the typing judgment along the type of natural numbers. So here's the collection of natural numbers, uh, terms of nat, type nat. And then we want to characterize the closed elements of this or the global elements of this, uh, cubically global elements of this. So on the other hand, in the gluing model upstairs, we also have this structure. And what we want to do is find a way to choose a good gluing model such that uh, the interpretation of the collection of natural numbers assigns a numeral to every piece of syntax. So if we try to understand what's actually going on in there, uh, we have some flexibility as to what we choose this interpretation to be. And what we're going to choose it to be is as follows. Um, so remember a computability family or an object in the gluing category, which lies over the collection of terms of type nat, is going to be a cubical set together with a map into the cubically global elements of that, uh, of the um, syntactic natural numbers. So we're just going to choose the upstairs part to be the natural numbers object in the uh, category of cubical sets. And then this map, uh, here is the universal map. It's the comparison map that uh, uh, encodes a natural number as an iteration of the successor operation in the syntax. Um, and so the fiber of this map at a particular 
uh, term of type nat is going to be an actual honest to God natural number, which, and, uh, which is encoded by that piece of syntax. And so if we can show that this is a model of cubical type theory, then we would actually obtain automatically using the picture I showed at the beginning with the universal map of the initial model, we would obtain automatically a real natural number for every uh, cubical closed term of type nat. Uh, so a corollary of this model construction is that cubical type theory has canonicity. And uh, this can be shown, uh, this can be seen to be sort of a mathematization of the canonicity results of Simon Huber um, and uh, Carlo and Julie, uh, Pavonia and Bob Harper. Um, uh, the, maybe this would be a good time to maybe mention uh, something about the history of this stuff. Um, we, uh, for many years, as type theorists, kind of only understood a syntactic way to do this using sort of uh, very jacked up or complex versions of Tate's method. Um, but for many years, there were kind of whispers in the community that there might be a better way to do this. Um, for many years, Steve Audi, for instance, was, uh, was suggesting that it should be possible to do this using gluing. Um, in uh, an early, very important advance was made in 2015 when Mike Schulman, uh, showed how to apply uh, gluing, uh, or actually something even more general than gluing, uh, to the semantics of dependent type theory in his paper, Univalence for Inverse Diagrams. Um, and in 2018, uh, Thierry Cocon um, uh, wrote a note called Canon uh, Canonicity and Normalization for Dependent Type Theory in a very syntactic style, which was uh, enough of a Rosetta Stone for the rest of us type theorists to understand uh, what was going on. Um, so this has been kind of a long process that many people have uh, contributed to, uh, and many people whose names I, I haven't mentioned, uh, but who you can find in uh, the paper that I mentioned at the beginning. Um, so that was easy, actually. <laughs> um, and I don't want to minimize it because the way that we used to do it was so hard that it was almost intractable to, to prove canonicity for cubical type theories. Um, uh, mainly the, the issue was that uh, the, if you try to treat cubical type theory in a traditional way as like untyped raw terms with some kind of reduction semantics and then use the old fashioned version of Tate's method on top of that, you have a problem where the reductions on the cubical parts of the type theory, things like higher dimensional terms, um, these reductions, uh, they don't commute with change of base along maps in the cube category. And so um, you end up needing some totally crazy uh, coherence uh, conditions on um, the computability uh, structures. Um, we avoid this problem completely by using this objective approach where we consider the abstract syntax of the initial model uh, where everything is already quotiented by definitional equivalence. Um, so this has been a, a big advance for us. And so we're very thankful to uh, the people who taught us uh, how to do this. Um, the next thing that we want to do, which is actually hard, and we're already working on it, is to prove normalization. So the difference between normalization and canonicity is that normalization, while canonicity characterizes the judgmental equivalence classes of closed terms of a specific type, in this case, the type of natural numbers, normalization characterizes the judgmental equivalence classes of open terms, that is, terms with arbitrary free variables um, of arbitrary type. And this is a meta theorem that we use, as I mentioned before, in order to uh, justify the implementation of type theory and make type theory actually usable for human beings. Um, in the case of cubical type theory, normalization is especially important because uh, the kind of equational side conditions that appear in type theory, uh, in cubical type theory, are about a thousand times more brutal than those that appear in ordinary type theory. So it's essential that we have an algorithm to, uh, to decide them. Um, so the basic template for this result is roughly the same as I described, except that uh, where before we started from an algebra for the interval and glued along a nerve that corresponds to that. Here we have to do something a bit different. Um, so in uh, sort of type theory black magic for many years, um, there has been a notion of Kripke logical relations, Kripke computability, many names for this thing. And in the 1990s, I think 1993, uh, Jung and Turin uh, sort of rationalized this amazingly effective method, which is something that like, if you look in a conference in programming languages, probably every paper is using Kripke logical relations. They rationalized this method uh, in a sort of a categorical form. Uh, basically, it's 
it is what you're doing when you glue along a nerve, period. And for proving normalization, the nerve that you want to glue along is pretty weird. What you do is you start with a category of formal contexts and formal renamings. Now, this is different from the category of context in, in uh, uh, an important way. The maps in this category correspond only to structural rules, um, or from the perspective of category theory, they correspond to projections and, and um, uh, symmetries and um, uh, sometimes uh, diagonals, uh, although not in the cubical case uh, for reasons that I won't explain right now. Um, and uh, because these formal contexts and formal renamings are like strictly more restricted than the substitutions, you get kind of a, a functor from the category of formal, formal contexts and renamings into the category of context and substitutions, which simply enacts every structural renaming as a substitution. And this functor uh, gives rise to a nerve. And if you glue along that nerve, then the gluing category that you get will be the appropriate setting in which to prove normalization. Now, this all sounds very mysterious, but I can simplify it. The reason why you want to prove normalization uh, in a way where you're considering families in the category of pre-sheafs over renamings instead of general substitutions or something else is that the notion of normal form is not a priori closed under general substitutions. For instance, uh, the variable x applied to the number 5 could be a normal form. But if I substitute something like lambda x dot x for x, then it's no longer a normal form. Uh, the force of the normalization theorem is to prove that we actually can find a normal form for that substitution. So a priori, in order to set up the theory, we need to uh, have a weaker kind of substitution that even the normal forms will be closed under. And that's renamings. So you can construct this model, but uh, if you do it, uh, you will not directly actually prove normalization because you need the additional property that every computable element of a type has a normal form. Um, and so in order to even state that, you need to say what the normal forms even are. Um, there's many ways to characterize the normal forms of type theory, but uh, I like to go back to Genson's sequent calculus, um, although maybe understood in a more modern way. So think about a type theory that has a product connected, a Cartesian product. Well, with the Cartesian product you have, uh, so, so here let this node be the Cartesian product of A and B, and so you have this span here, which is the projection maps. Um, and so these are sort of the elimination rules for the Cartesian product, the first and second projection. And then the universal property of the Cartesian product gives you two things. One, if you have an element of A and an element of B, then you have an element of A times B. Um, so that's the existence part of the universal property. And the universality part is that this is uh, unique, uh, unique in, in, uh, for this diagram. Now, um, from a perspective of type theory, this map, the existence part, is the introduction rule. These two maps, the span, are the elimination rules. And uh, the uniqueness of this map is the ether rule in the type theory. And the fact that these triangles commute is the beta rules in the type theory. And when you're trying to characterize normal forms, what you're really trying to do is find a version of the type theory that has no rules of equality. Normal forms are meant to be some kind of a totally discrete theory. And then a normalization theorem is to prove that all those equations that you put in your equational theory of type theory, if you rearrange the operations, in a very special way, then you don't need any equation. That's what normalization means, because you're trying to find a concrete representation of equivalence classes. Uh, so where do equations in type theory come from? Well, they come from beta and eta rules, so the fact that this commutes and the fact that this is unique. So if we could find a representation where we would never need to apply those rules, then that would be a good candidate for normal forms. And the way that this works is that you kind of take every connective and you sort of split it in two, like a left aspect and a right aspect. The right aspect I'm writing in blue and the left aspect I'm writing in red. And you just kind of yank them apart. And now you have this double vision situation where every object, like A times B, is now represented by two objects. One which appears on the left side of arrows and another which is good to have on the right hand side of arrows. And I'm gonna use L and R for those. And, um, 
I, I don't mean to imply any particular functoriality in here. I, I just mean that for every object, you have to choose one of these L and R. And so the span part, or the projection, or the elimination part, these are maps in the left version of everything. Whereas the introduction form, these are maps in the right version of everything. And because L of A is not the same as R of A, there's no sense in which I can ask for the diagrams to commute, so the beta rules are out. And there's no sense in which I can ask, oops, I can ask for the uniqueness of this map. So I've deleted all the equations. And now what remains is to show that uh, this characterization is enough, essentially that I can get from L to R. Um, now, the fact that you can get from L to R is uh, what Gensen called identity expansion in the context of the sequent calculus. Now, the converse, getting from R to L, is what Gensen called cut uh, in the uh, sequent calculus. And um, uh, so that is going to be sort of the basic intuition that we worked under. Historically, these what I'm calling left normal forms have been referred to as neutrals in the literature. And what I'm calling right normal forms have been referred to as just normal forms. But I like this left and right. It's, I think it's better. Um, so uh, the important thing is that when we characterize the normal forms of a connective, we want this double vision version to live in the gluing category. And with respect to the gluing fibration, we want it to live over the ordinary. Um, the ordinary versions of everything. So the projections here should live over the actual projections in the syntax, and the introduction form should live over the actual introduction form in the syntax. And here you have the universal properties. Um, so this, uh, this problem of uh, showing that the uh, left and right normal forms are enough to characterize the, um, uh, the syntax of type theory is the gluing theorem that we're going to prove. And what you do is you have to attach to every type, uh, say type X, you have to attach to that an ability to go from computable elements of X, I'm writing that with a tilde here, to normal forms, and the ability to go from left normal forms into computable elements. Uh, and you can sort of think of this as, as this picture here, where here, where my mouse is, if you can see that, the middle part is the computable, the computability family. This down here is the syntax. This is the left normal forms, and this is the right normal forms. And we simply require that these maps are vertical in the sense that you take a left normal form of an element to a computability proof of that element. And you take a computability proof of a particular element to a right normal form of that element. That's what this picture means. Um, so this was worked out um, uh, for simple type theory uh, uh, at least twice, uh, once by Altenkirch, Hoffman, and Streicher in the beautiful paper, uh, Categorical uh, Reconstruction of a Normalization Proof or something like that. I probably got the name wrong. And then it was um, uh, developed in a slightly different uh, style uh, as well um, in uh, Marcello Fiore's uh, very important paper, Semantic Analysis of Normalization by Evaluation from 2002. Um, and so we owe a lot to, uh, to uh, these, um, these uh, forerunners in the context of simple type theory. And more recently in, tw in 2018, uh, excuse me, in 2016, um, ideas of this kind uh, were developed in the dependent type theoretic setting by uh, Altenkirch and Kaposi, and um, then translated into the language of gluing by Thierry Cocon in 2018. Um, what we have done is uh, situate this in a more categorical uh, style that is more amenable to um, mathematical manipulation. So what you need is left normal forms and right normal forms of types, first of all, because types have to have normal forms. And so this map from left normal forms into computable types uh, is called reflection. And the one from computable types into right normal forms is called reification. And uh, these actually correspond to the two fundamental operations of normalization by evaluation, which is a method uh, to normalize uh, the syntax of type theory that was invented by Per Martinlöf in the 1970s um, and uh, has been sort of reinvented about 20 different times uh, since then. Uh, to, uh, and in fact, most proof assistants are based on ideas relating to normalization by evaluation, even if they don't actually execute a normalization algorithm. 
Um, now, in addition to having normal forms of types, we also need to have normal forms of elements. And so if tau is the projection of elements, uh, of types from the elements, then we require this sort of dependent version of the reified reflect diagram, uh, where we can take a, um, a left normal form of an element of some type to a computability proof for that element, and then we can go further and take it to a right normal form for that element. Um, uh, then the idea is that in our Gluey model of type theory, we need to interpret the collection of types as basically the collection of diagrams like this. So a type contains the data of its reflection and reification maps. Um, and that's sort of the, the important aspect of uh, normalization for dependent type theory that um, uh, Alton Kirsch and Kaposi and also Cocon um, have contributed. Um, whereas in the past for simple type theory, it was possible to exhibit these structures after the fact by induction. Um, this is sort of the, the end of my story for now. So I would like to um, uh, switch modes into uh, questions and discussion. Uh, thank you. Okay. Well, thank you so much, John. That was really interesting. We will do our usual silent applause now. <laughs> And we have lots of time for questions, so let's take advantage of that. Um, somebody talking? Uh, thank you, John. Uh, that was wonderful. Um, uh, when you talked about left and right normal forms, uh, uh, it seems like there's some relation to polarity. Uh, is, is there, or am I way off base? Uh, let's see here. Um, there. So the question is about, um, about polarity, which is um, in, in structural proof theory, um, especially when you delete the structural rules of type theory, you can, um, you can see that um, certain connectives uh, uh, work really well on the right, but not so well on the left, and other connectives work really well on the left, but not very well on the right. Um, so this is kind of a very mysterious aspect of logic um, that is very hard to see uh, when you are working in a type theory that has uh, where the diagonal map can be formed. Um, there, is a, there is a connection, um, but it's kind of tenuous and it's uh, a bit difficult to make precise in the context of, uh, of type theory uh, where you have all the structural rules. I think I saw someone else unmute their mic. Is, is there another question? Um, so I'll, I'll ask, um, do you have other plans for applying these methods to other problems? Uh, thank you for asking that. It's almost as if I planted you with that question. <laughs> So, uh, so far we've been proving theorems about type theories, and these all basically look the same. Like, they all kind of have the flavor of a canonicity theorem, but maybe it's like a super jacked up canonicity theorem, but basically it's still a canonicity theorem. Um, on the other hand, in programming languages, um, which is where maybe the richest use of Kate's method um, has uh, occurred so far historically, uh, very few of the theorems that you prove using this method have the appearance of uh, canonicity theorems. The functors that you glue along are much weirder um, if you can find a way to phrase it as a functor. And the thing that you glue from may not be the initial model. Um, this is maybe not so surprising considering that in every discipline, um, the applications of this look very different. I mean, like this, what I'm describing looks very different from what you use gluing for in geometry. Um, so one application that uh, we are currently exploring um, in joint work with uh, Robert Harper is um, the application of gluing in two different ways to uh, the theory of program modules. Now this is not a module in the sense that maybe 90% of the room uh, are thinking of them. A program module in the context of programming languages is, um, it's like a, it's kind of hard to explain, but it's like a unit of abstraction. Uh, so for instance, like a hash table can be implemented as a program module. And the point of modules in organizing programs or, or like engineering projects is to um, 
uh, allow parameterization in part of your program in an, an implementation of some abstract interface and to allow abstraction uh, over um, that interface and also to allow hierarchy of components. And uh, a very tantalizing aspect of program modules is that there is always a, what's called a dynamic and a static component. The static component is stuff like, um, like the types of things, things that don't really matter at runtime, or maybe we can say that they are fixed as soon as you compile your program. On the other hand, there are dynamic aspects, which can only be understood during the execution of the program. Now, the variation of the dynamical aspects of a program module over the static aspects of the program module can be seen uh, to be an instance of gluing. And in fact, this was um, sort of uh, predicted, maybe not using the language of gluing, by uh, work of Eugenio Moji, uh, Moji in the early 1990s. Um, so that's one aspect of the theory of gluing in the context of programming languages. Now, the other side of it is that we also intend to use a, another gluing construction to prove what are called representation independence results for um, program modules that vary over other program modules. That is, like, for instance, suppose I give the interface of a data structure, like a hash table, and then I have a term of type Boolean that is parametric in that uh, implementation of that module. Um, I can use gluing along a certain diagonal functor in order to prove that uh, no matter which implementation of the hash table I give, I will get the same Boolean out at the end. This is kind of a parametricity result. Um, so these are two interesting ways to apply gluing in the, in the context of programming languages that uh, Bob and I are currently exploring. Okay, thank you. More questions? This is our chance to interact socially. <laughs> yeah, you're going to be locked up in your rooms for the rest of the week. Well, I guess I'll ask again along those lines. So because you mentioned earlier that uh, some of the ideas that you're using here had sort of developed, you know, via uh, or related to logical relations. And now you've talked about a theorem that one would often use logical relations for. So is the hope maybe that a lot of what logical relations um, uh, now do, and maybe Danny can jump in on that too, um, can be sort of subsumed by this more categorical approach? That's what we would hope, uh, but we're really a very long way away from that. Um, maybe this is a good chance for me to unleash another bit of a, uh, some, some opinions uh, about history uh, here. Um, so why is it that in programming languages and computer science, we have been like using these raw terms and rewriting systems on raw terms and then logical relations over those things instead of just some super cool categorical uh, setup with functorial semantics and all that? Well, it's not because we're like worshiping raw terms or something like that. It's actually because we have no idea um, how to phrase most of the things we do in a categorical way. Um, the problems of programming languages are unbelievably hard because we must deal with things that are um, uh, not super compositional, uh, like computational effects when you print to the console and things like that. Only very recently are we beginning to get an understanding of what the semantic or categorical content of these things is. So currently, in order to deal with um, the kinds of wild stuff that happens in real programming languages, we really have needed to use these um, methods that are based on operational semantics, um, and uh, rewriting and, and things like that. Now the hope is that we can eventually uh, continue to carve more and more and more out of that into this more abstract uh, style where we can maybe replace you know, 200,000 lines of brutal cock formalizations with uh, you know, 50 pages of uh, some you know, reasonable high level mathematics or uh, something like that, which would be a big improvement for us. Um, or uh, you know, things like that. Um, so I guess the answer to your question is that we really want that to happen, but the problems are really difficult, and I don't want to I don't want to underestimate the the difficulty of the problems and the um, the efforts that people have made in the past to to resolve them. Okay. Next question.
Okay, well, I guess if there aren't any more, we will thank John again. Right, well, lots of you. thumbs up. Yeah. <laughs> um, and our next talk is by Denise Charles Szynski on April 2nd in two weeks. Um, and uh, that's it for now. So thanks. <laughs>